So we are live on YouTube. Sir, we are live on YouTube. Can we start, sir? Shall I start? No? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, good afternoon, everyone. I, I welcome everyone to the today's uh, respiratory webinar. I'm Dr. Sarok Sonavle from Medical Affair, Dr. Reddy's laboratory. So, I will be the moderator for this session. And in today's uh, webinar, we will see the presentation on approach to a respiratory tract infection. And to present this, we have a Dr. Pallab Chatterjee with us. So let me introduce him first. Dr. Pallab Chatterjee has done a MD Pediatrics, DNB Pediatrics, as well as BCH. He is the Fellow of Indian Academy of Pediatrics and an European Diplomat of Pediatric Respiratory Medicine. He underwent training in a pediatric pulmonology at the Institute of Child Health, Chennai, and under Dr. Robert Wood of Cincinnati Hospital, USA. He is uh, he's attached to a various hospital like uh, Columbia Asia, Apollo Hospital, Amri Hospital, um, Medica Synergy Hospital, Rabindranath Tagore International Institute of Cardiac Sciences. He is currently a member of executive member of IFT. He is the founder member of the National Respiratory Chapter of Pediatric Pomology and currently the chairperson of the West Bengal chapter. He has authored a chapter in a various textbook like IIP Pediatrics, PG textbook of pediatrics. So I welcome Dr. Pallab Chatterjee for this session. Looking forward for your session. Hello, good afternoon. And uh, I hope everybody is fine and uh, up and about because we are supposed to uh, end the lockdown from tomorrow. Uh, Okay, so uh, without much ado, I will start off with whatever is the plan for today and approach to respiratory infections. And uh, why we, are, we need to talk about this is pneumonia is a bad disease and it kills a large number of uh, children, uh, more children than any other infectious diseases, claiming the lives of over 8 lakhs of children under 5 every year or around 2,200 every day so it is nothing not very uh, uh, mine not a minor disease and uh, why it is important is in the current scenario when we are talking about covid and all that probably we should not be neglecting something like uh, uh, this pneumonia globally there are around 1400 cases of pneumonia per lakh children or ev one in every 71 children every year is affected with pneumonia. However, from 2000, the under five deaths due to pneumonia is coming down and it's declined around 54%. So let us straight away come to a case. A child, uh, a five-year-old child was brought with acute onset of cough. So you have an acute onset of cough. Sir, please share your presentation. It wasn't shared. I'm so sorry. Please, Is it visible now? No, sir, it's loading. Sir. Is it yes, okay? Now it's visible. Yeah. Okay. So this sir, is the first case that we will put were... this into presentation mode. This yeah. is the first case. Yeah. This is the first case that we were talking about. A uh, five-year-old came with an acute onset of cough and uh, what was happening was uh, this child was having a, a also associated diarrhea. 
So there are two things that are going on together. So two systems involved. One is the respiratory system where there is cough and uh, rhinorrhea, there is diarrhea. And again, there are similar cases in the family. So what do we think? So if there are two, so there's a history of contact in the family or in the surroundings, there are two systems involved, then it's probably a viral infection. Investigations, any investigations that we need to do in these kids, uh, children, do we need to do a blood count? Do we need to do a throat swab and all these other investigations? Usually, no, because this is usually a seasonal viral pharyngotonsillitis. So this is something very, very common that we get in this uh, season. A viral pharyngotonsillitis does not need any investigation. So you can see the, the redness, you can see the furry tongue. So these are very important signs in a viral pharyngotonsillitis. Another child, a similar age group, again, a very acute onset, a very high grade fever. Here, this child doesn't have much of cough, a mild cough, no rhinorrhea, but a difficulty in swallowing. This child is having difficulty in swallowing. And again, there are no similar cases around. And you look at the throat, there is a purulent discharge in the throat and there are tender uh, cervical lymphadenopathy and a very angry looking red colored throat. Now, what do you think about this child? So previous child had uh, two systems involved. There was history of contact around. This child doesn't have a lot of contact. So we think of a bacterial infection. And what are the investigations that we need to do? Whether we need to do a rapid antigen detection test, whether we need to do a culture sensitivity, we need to decide. So this is bacterial. So there is a typical difference between the viral infections and the bacterial infections, then how do you know? So you see the swollen uvula, you see the red uh, swollen tonsils, it can be white spots on the tonsils, and you see the red swollen throat, you can see the furry tongue. This is very typical of a viral infection. A bacterial infection will have a very uh, 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 swollen tonsils, there'll be a swollen throat, and there will be absence of cough. So the cough will be minimal. There will be tonsillar exudates. There will be history of fever, tender cervical lymphadenopathy, and the typical age group. So why is this important to know whether we are dealing with a bacterial or a viral? That will determine the uh, course of the disease and the therapy that we need to give. So that brings us to a criteria called uh, Centaur criteria where you look for the same things that we were discussing, tonsillar exudates, whether we have anterior tender cervical lymphadenopathy and fever, and whether there is absence of cough. So if it is less than three, so you give one point to each of these, if it is less than three, then it is very unlikely to be a group A streptococcal pharyngitis. If it's more than three, then probably we are dealing with a group A streptococcal infection. Now, cultures are the gold standard for a group A beta hemolytic streptococcal detection and rapid antigen detection tests can also be done, which detect the presence of a group A beta hemolytic streptococcal cell wall carbohydrate. However, it is less sensitive than uh, throat swab. How it, you can get the report much earlier, but if you get a negative RADT, then it does not exclude a group uh, 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 beta hemolytic streptococcal infection and you need to do a culture to actually rule out whether it's a group A beta hemolytic streptococcal. So a culture is the gold standard, but usually we don't need all these. It can be done on the clinical grounds only, whether it is a viral or a bacterial. Now what happens to the first guy, the, uh, the kid Suprio? He comes back after 10 days with a fever and a headache and there is thick purulent nasal discharge. So after 10 days of the first infection, fever, headache, purulent nasal discharge, some periorbital edema and tenderness on percussion. So we all know this child has developed a complication. This is one of the complications that can happen to a child who is suffering from a viral upper respiratory infection. Now, why is this important? This is important because even in a viral infection, when we know this is typical viral pharyngotonsillitis, we need to inform the parents that you have to be on the lookout and if there is a problem, please come back and then there can be other problems of 
this cold. So again, remember this 10 day period. So 10 days, usually the viral infection should subside by 10 days. If it is persisting beyond 10 days, if the purulent nasal discharge is persisting beyond 10 days, probably we, ha we have to think in the lines of a bacterial infection and sinusitis can be one of the common reasons. And imaging, when is it done? It is not required to diagnose a, a, a sinusitis. So imaging is not required. Only indications for imaging is when the sinusitis is non-responsive, when it is recurrent, when there are, we are thinking of anatomical abnormalities, if there are orbital or CNS complications. And only in these four cases, we will need to do a imaging of the sinus. And what we need to do is a, a limited cut CT scan of the paranasal sinus is good enough. If you want to avoid the uh, radiation, then MRI. Otherwise, a limited cut CT will be good enough to diagnose. But usually, no imaging is required to diagnose a CT scan. Rather, it can cause uh, radiation and it, it will be difficult to interpret because of some mucosal thickening. The second child again comes back after five days again with high fever. So this, this guy had a bacterial infection in the throat. Now he's got a high fever, refusal to feed, noisy breathing, prefers to lie on one side. So now we are what we are dealing with is a retropharyngeal abscess. So you uh, sometimes you don't need to do a CT scan also. Uh, X-ray lateral view of the neck will be good enough to diagnose. And clinical grounds, you can also think of a retropharyngeal abscess. So suddenly if this child has worsened and uh, you can diagnose a retropharyngeal abscess in this child. So that is the justification of investigation and diagnosing such a child with a uh, worsening of a acute bacterial uh, tonsillitis. Okay, we have another child, a four month old female child who came with a four day history of cold and cough and high grade fever with now this child has got difficulty in breathing. So previous children did not have a lot of difficulty in breathing. Now this child has got a difficulty in breathing and the maid was having a severe cold and cough. So there was a history of contact. This child is pretty sick looking and this child has got a clear nasal discharge with a harsh cough and the throat looks congested. Respiratory rate is high. There are recessions and there are conducted sounds with scattered fine ronchi and crepitations. So what is this child having? Something very, very, very commonly that we see in this age and this period is a, 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 ch a child with is, uh, this problem coming in clusters starts with fever and coryza and probably a first episode in an infant of a wheeze, we call these as an acute bronchiolitis. Subsequent episodes, we do not use the term as a recurrent bronchiolitis. So we think of other causes of uh, probably a viral wheeze or something like that. But the first episode is usually termed as a acute bronchiolitis and it is graded as mild, moderate and severe. And that depends on whether the what is the feeding ability of this child, what is the respiratory distress, and the SATs. So if the child is feeding well, if the child has got little or no respiratory distress, and the saturations is maintaining more than 92% in room air, then it is called a mild bronchiolitis. A moderate bronchiolitis appears short of breath during feeding. Otherwise, the child is fine. There is some moderate distress some chest retractions, some nasal flaring, and brief self-limiting episodes of apneas, then this child has got a moderate respiratory distress, a moderate bronchiolitis, and the saturations are correctable easily with oxygen. A severe bronchiolitis, a child is reluctant or unable to feed. There is severe distress with marked chest wall retractions, nasal flaring and grunting, and they can have prolonged apneas and saturations may or may not be correctable with oxygen. So uh, that's how you, got, uh, you grade them as a mild, a moderate, and a severe uh, bronchiolitis. Treatment differs, so that is why we need to uh, classify them. So clinically, instead of doing a lot of scorings, we can actually look at the child and we can diagnose whether this child needs treatment. So a mild usually does not need treatment, 
the child, mother can be reassured. But as usual with any other viral infections, we need to tell the mother that to bring back the child, that these are the warning signs. And if the child is worsening, please bring the child back to the hospital. A moderate uh, bronchiolitis needs to be admitted and humidified oxygen needs to be given to keep the saturations above 92%. IV fluids might be required if the child is not feeling well and observe if the child is deteriorating. A severe bronchiolitis, if the moderate deteriorates or the child is severe, then the child needs to be admitted straight away in the ICU. The child, uh, we need to do a cardiorespiratory monitoring, ABG is chest x-rays, and we need to assess if the child needs ventilatory support or ICU care. Now, usually we don't need to do much investigations in a child with a viral infection. This child was uh, investigated because the problems were persisting. The child was quite sick and this was the X-ray and this was the blood report in this child. So this child initially, uh, uh, though the child looks like a viral infection, if the child does not respond to your treatment, usually a bronchiolitis should respond by two days. That's the average, but by four to five days, they should be fine. But if the child is not responding, then you need to think whether we are dealing with something else. Now, upper respiratory infections, we don't go and investigate all the upper respiratory infections in preschool and school age children, because it's quite common around six to eight episodes of cold and cough in a year is quite normal. And these cold symptoms again last for around 10 to 14 days. Again, the value of 10 comes here. So we need to remember this. Why is this 10 so important? Because all viral infections, they usually last by, uh, they usually recover by 10 to 14 days. So if it is persisting beyond 10 days, a severe uh, distress, cold, a cold which has continued beyond 10 days, then think of uh, a, a child with a uh, probably an asthma. So every time the patients, uh, uh, the, uh, the parents come and tell us that my child has a recurrent cold and this cold lasts every time beyond 10 days, we have to keep asthma in, our, in the back of our mind. So that is why the cold, uh, the 10 days is very important in any virus. So a viral uh, uh, nasal discharge becoming thick, fever persisting beyond 10 days, think of a sinusitis, a viral infection with the wheeze persisting beyond the wheeze persisting beyond 10 days, don't consider it as a viral anymore. It could be something else. However, we have to, though we have to keep this in our mind, we have to remember also that a cough can last for two to three weeks in a case of viral infection. So sometimes we can have a prolonged cough of up to a month in a child with a, a viral infection. Fever usually lasts, not, does not last for more than two days. So that is the viral infection that we can have in a child. Now, what we did in this child is we did went ahead and did a, a biofire. This is something that we can do uh, nowadays very commonly to detect what is the, uh, the infective organism. So uh, the one that we got here is... Uh, uh, Influenza A, influenza A, the RNA was detected. So that is important to diagnose. Uh, so what is the, uh, the uh, by the biofas? Other, other um, organisms that we can detect is adenovirus and the RSV. So there are various other viruses that can be detected, virus and bacteria that can be detected. But these are the dangerous ones that we need to find out because so here we were thinking of a rhinovirus which is leading to a, a, a bronchiolitis but it can be something else so here we have a, what is, what is the importance we have a treatment for this so we can start medication if we think of a influenza a infection particularly in the times of an epidemic or a pandemic that situation that is going on for a flu we can uh, do this test and we can start man a treatment for these uh, tests rsv we know wh what is the course of this disease so we can plan accordingly adenovirus also is one of the common viral infections in children that we see leads to a chronic lung disease and various other problems so this is a typical uh, uh, a panel that is done 
So one test can detect more than 20 respiratory pathogens. So this is the biofire test that is done and the common uh, investing uh, viruses are this adenovirus, the various, the common uh, coronaviruses and probably we will have the, the COVID-19 also the coronavirus SARS-2 uh, also the, which can be included in a few uh, days or months time in the same uh, panel. We have the influenza uh, range over here, particularly all the influenza A's, the influenza B's, the RSV's, and among the bacteria, we have the pertussis, the chlamydia, and the mycoplasma. We don't need to know how it is done, but what we need to really know is how to take the swab. So we need to take extra precaution for ourselves when we take the swab. So if it is possible, wear a PPE, particularly in this uh, in this uh, pandemic situation, or uh, we have to take adequate precautions like putting putting on a, a face shield, putting on a, a, a mask, and then you there will be two. Uh, you will find two sticks, uh, swab sticks. So one of those is introduced into the nostril to clear the nose, and the second one, the th hard one, is introduced in the nostril, and there will be a thinner one. Uh, that which with a, uh, which is loaded on a wire that is inserted right inside and then it is rotated inside the uh, nasopharynx and you take the uh, swab from the nasopharynx so that is important because usually if you don't do that if you insert the swab straight away then you will get a lot of rhinovirus uh, in the reports so we don't need a lot of rhinovirus to come in the report we actually want to need uh, see what is the uh, the virus which is there in the nasopharynx. So first the nose has to be cleared and then the swab has to be taken from the nasopharynx. It has to be inserted into a viral transport medium and sent to the lab at the earliest. And we need to know that these are notifiable diseases. And flu is pretty common. So even last year, if you see the, the states which are badly affected this year with the coronavirus infection, are very similar to the ones that were affected last year with the uh, with the H1N1 in our country. So H1N1 and uh, flu is quite common in our country and it is quite prevalent and now it has become endemic. Uh, so and why is it, uh, what happens is uh, over the years when we check for these, uh, uh, the viruses, if you see that the viruses go on changing. So here what happens is the H1N1 is more in the early part of the year. And as the year proceeds, the H1N1 comes down and the B type increases. And here again, the H1N1 again starts increasing. Uh, but the B, uh, uh, the, what is increasing, the major uh, part is taken up by the other types of influenza A. So there is a there is a, 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 a pattern of uh, this thing which goes on changing, and that is why every year we have a different vaccine. So it has to be predicted that what will be the pattern this year, and according to that we have a vaccine. So the importance of knowing what serotype or what subtype of influenza is causing the disease is important to know what uh, vaccine has to be prepared for that year. So high-risk groups are infants and children below the age of two years, uh, those with chronic pulmonary disease, chronic cardiac disease, metabolic disorders, renal disease, chronic hepatic disease, neurological conditions, hemoglobinopathies, immunosuppression, and those children who are on chronic aspirin or chronic prednisolone therapy. So these are children who are high-risk groups and we need to give the vaccine to these children and they are at risk for developing complications following a uh, influenza infection. And uh, the management of these uh, children, previously Xanamivir uh, was available, now it is no more available and it is given as an inhalational form and uh, the it ha it has is uh, we have to take uh, precautions particularly in children who have a tendency to develop uh, asthma or respiratory distress so that is why zanamivir is not used anymore it's not available oseltamivir is still available however we are developing some resistance to oseltamivir so we have to be very careful when we choose this drug for uh, a flu Chemoprophylaxis again in patients who are transplant units, severely immunosuppressed, 
neonatal units and in these situations when influenza infection is present in the institution immediate immediate community and the higher risk in, in uh, individuals have been exposed now we come to an older child 11 year old boy uh, weight is around 28 kgs was brought with a high grade fever of around 104 there was a grunt so there was a fever there was a grunt and this child was having refusal to feed and this child was tachypneic and the sats were pretty low so a saturation of 89 with 6 liters of oxygen you don't usually give 6 liters of oxygen with a mask so this is uh, this child was in severe respiratory distress there were a lot of recessions breath sounds were reduced and there was some ronchi scattered and uh, uh, we did a uh, so this child needs uh, investigation. Now WHO recommends using respiratory rate cutoffs to diagnose pneumonia. So this is not really meant for doctors. It is meant for to be uh, for the uh, healthcare workers who are working at the community level. And for them, if it is uh, 60 or more at the age of two below the age of two months, if it is 50 or more below the age of one year, or if if it is 40 or more uh, till five years of age then uh, you think of pneumonia. So why is this important? Because if the respiratory rate is more, think of pneumonia, start an antibiotic, that is meant for the community healthcare workers. So what investigations do we need to do when we are thinking of a child with uh, pneumonia? Do we need to do a chest X-ray? Not in all patients. So not all patients with community acquired pneumonia will need a chest X-ray, particularly if they are on domiciliary treatment. But yes, if you're thinking of complications, supposing if you're thinking of pleural effusion, if the child is uh, not presenting with a correct clinical features, uh, you have some doubts, child is very sick, definitely you will need to do a chest X-ray. Routine uh, microbiological tests, again, they are of no use. A total count, uh, CRP, uh, differential count, are uh, not diagnostic, but it is useful to monitor the response to treatment. But what is very important is pulse oximetry. Pulse oximetry is now considered as one of the uh, a clinical sign that needs to be done. And it's a bedside uh, thing. It has to be used in the outpatient department. So a pulse oximetry is very important to diagnose what we are dealing with in these children. Now, how do we know what is the etiological agent? So bacteria cause around the majority of the infections, uh, uh, pneumonias around 60%, 35% is caused by viruses. And of the bacteria, we have the H influenza. However, the incidence of H influenza is coming down now depend because of the vaccinations. Uh, strep pneumonia is becoming more important. Staphylococcus, mycoplasma is seen more above five years of age and chlamydia, and then there are mixed infections again. So risk factors for pneumonia, male is slightly more than female. It's socially, uh, socioeconomic and environmental factors like uh, lower socioeconomic status, low maternal education level, poor access to care, indoor air pollution is very important, lack of breastfeeding, malnutrition is very important. And this is something that we need to always keep in mind is cigarette smoke, particularly the passive smoke exposure. So we need to inform uh, parents about the, and educate them regarding the passive smoke exposure. Underlying cardiopulmonary disorders and medical conditions are very important. So if this child has got a congenital heart disease, a BPD, uh, uh, something like a cystic fibrosis, asthma, sickle cell disease, neuromuscular disorders, uh, severe gastrointestinal disorders and immunodeficiency disorders. So these children are at risk for development of pneumonia. In neonates, what happens is in early onset uh, pneumonia, if there is a prolonged rupture of membranes, uh, maternal uh, evidence of amnionitis, a premature delivery, fetal tachycardia, maternal interpartum fever. So these are, uh, uh, these are the risk factors for pneumonia, early onset pneumonia. Late onset pneumonia is VAP. That is the commonest one. It is uh, once the child is on ventilators. Other things are the anomalies of the airways. We need to think of the anomalies of the airways. Mm -hmm. And if there are severe underlying diseases, nosocomial pneumonias, if the child is uh, in the hospital for a long time, 
and poor hand washing and overcrowding in the nursery. So these are things that we need to take care of when we are dealing with a neonate in the hospital. So again, the uh, age-related pathogens, when, uh, when we have a very young uh, zero to three month old infant, so the commonest is gram negative. And then they are followed by strep pyogenes, chlamydia and viruses. So uh, whenever we have a pneumonia uh, in a young child, we need to think of gram negative infections first. Three months to five years, here the strep pneumonia becomes more important than the gram negative. So it's all the gram positives here, the H influenza, the staph uh, aureus, mycoplasma pneumonia comes into the picture, viruses are still there. Above five years of age, viruses become more important, strep pneumonia, staph is still there, mycoplasma pneumonia is now very important. And the others are the strep, uh, staphylo, uh, the H influenza and the strep pyogenes. So these are the things that we need to take care, uh, uh, think about in a child. So that is how you need, you can think of what is the infective agent in the child and you can decide on the antibiotics that are required. Other things are supposing if this child had a, a predisposing uh, history of pyoderma or measles, then you think of staphylococcus more in these children, a child with HIV, think of pneumocystis, if this child has got a neutropenia, then think of a gram-negative infection or an aspergillus infection. A cystic fibrosis, a younger age group will have staphylococcus, an older age group will have pseudomonas. So uh, these are common infections in a, strep, uh, in a cystic fibrosis uh, patient. Uh, severe uh, PEM will have gram-negative infection and staph. And if this child has got an aspiration pneumonia, then you need to cover for anaerobes. So you can get clues to the diagnosis because it is difficult to grow the germ in a case of pneumonia, other than doing a good bronchial lavage. Sometimes even that does not uh, give you the results. So when you suspect a child with a MRSA, so uh, you start off with a ceftriaxone plus floxacillin plus vancomycin and clindamycin if the child is very severe till you get the culture report. And uh, the moment you get the culture report, you can de-escalate. A very sick child, when you are thinking of a Panton valentine leukocyte toxin, then clindamycin and linezolate are good choices. But we need to remember that linezolate has got, has got an excellent bioavailability and tissue distri distribution is very good in the lungs and it can be continued per orally, though it is a bacteriostatic uh, drug. So uh, in the lungs, when we are thinking of a pneumonia, particularly an MRSA, then linozolid is a good choice. Clindamycin also is an excellent choice in a uh, child with a MRSA. Now, what happened to our child? The CRP was very high. The total count was very high. There was 80% neutrophils. Blood culture and sputum showed no growth. And this was the X-ray in this child. And we, as was, uh, we were thinking clinically, this child has got a right-sided pneumonia. So do we need to do a CT scan and an X-ray in every child with pneumonia? CT scan, probably not. X-ray, yes, if the child is very sick and the child has got admitted and you're thinking of some complications, you can you should do a CT scan, but, uh, uh, sorry, a chest X-ray, but a CT scan is usually not required uh, in a child unless you are uh, thinking of a severe complication like a lung abscess or uh, uh, plural effusion, which is worsening, or some uh, some uh, empyema or something which you need to drain. So sometimes uh, uh, this is uh, some extra investigations are done, which are usually not required. Now assessing the severity, how do you assess the severity of a pneumonia? So it uh, a severe pneumonia and a, uh, is one which has got a tachypnea with the usage of the accessory muscles of respiration. The very severe pneumonia is along with that, you have some altered sensorium, you can have cyanosis, you can have difficulty in feeding, or you can have some poor perfusion. So in a infant, the temperature is less than 38.5 degrees, the, uh, the respiratory rate is less than 50, there'll be mild recessions and the child will be feeding well. So you think of a mild pneumonia in these children. A severe pneumonia where the fever is very high, the child is, is tachypneic, there is moderate to severe recessions, 
there's a lot of nasal flaring, sinuses, intermittent apneas, grunt, and the child is not feeding. So this is a severe pneumonia. In an older child, again, the similar uh, uh, temperature and respiratory rate, mild breathlessness, and in a severe, again, this got a high fever with severe respiratory distress, severe uh, difficulty uh, in breathing with nasal flaring, grunt, cyanosis, and dehydration. So these are how we can assess the severity of a child with a, in, uh, with a pneumonia. When do we admit these children in hospitals? In infants, if the, if the respiratory uh, saturation is less than seven, uh, 92 and the respiratory rate is more than 70 with uh, difficulty in breathing, the child is having intermittent apnea with grunt and this child is not feeding. And we need to be very careful about this that you, when you are sending the child home, a uh, child with pneumonia, the family should be able to provide appropriate observation and supervision and get the child back to the hospital whenever the child is worsening. So if you are sure that uh, this can happen, the child can be sent home. Otherwise, any child with uh, pneumonia should be hospitalized. In older children, it's the same thing again, where you have the saturations which are low, the, there is tachypnea and uh, there is difficulty in breathing, grunting, and the child is not feeding well, there is cyanosis, and the family is not able to observe the child at home. So then you need to uh, admit. So when do you admit the child in ICU? So when you are thinking of a child requiring a positive pressure vent ventilation, so that is the time when you need to admit the child in the intensive care unit, and the child has got a fluid refractory shock. There is hypoxemia, which is requiring FiO2 greater than the inspired concentration or flu feasible in general care units. So that is very important. So if you're needing a FiO2 of more than 0.5 to 0.6, then you need to uh, think, uh, say that the child is having uh, hypoxemia uh, with the uh, SATs coming down to less than 92%. If the child is having uh, mental status, uh, which is altered, so that could be a very bad uh, sign. It is one of the, uh, this thing for severe uh, pneumonia, recurrent apnea, severe grunt, slow irregular breathing, rising respiratory rate and heart rate with clinical evidence of severe respiratory distress and exhaustion. So these are all indications of hospital of admission in ICU and probably need for a positive pressure ventilation. Uh, either invasive or non-invasive. All children treated with pneumonia should be reassessed. So whether they've gone home, whether they're in the hospital, they need to be reassessed for clinical improvement and deterioration or persistence of fever. And they should be given oxygen and the saturation should be maintained always above 92%. Dehydrated children should be provided adequate amount of oral fluids. And if they are unable to drink, should receive in intravenous fluids. Electrolytes and creatinine levels should be monitored. And if the child fails to improve, so uh, within 48 to 72 hours, then you think of the possible complications or you think of some organism which is resistant to your antibiotics. So what are the empiric antibiotic regimen that you decide to give to a child? The first line would be in young children, amoxicillin. And in adolescents, you can think of azithromycin but amoxicillin will be probably my first choice even in adolescents. Second line probably can, can be macrolides and uh, uh, it, you can add fluoroquinolones if you are thinking of uh, uh, a child with a atypical organism. Also uh, use for children with older uh, or, or uh, adolescent or an older child when they are hypersensitivity, they have hypersensitivity to beta lactam antibiotics, you can think of fluoroquinolones in these children. Inpatient, we, you, uh, you can start with ampicillin, which is not usually given. We usually start off with amoxicillin, or you can give a cephalosporin plus azithromycin uh, uh, as a first line. Second line, if the child is not responding, then we go to vancomycin or linezolid or clindamycin. So if the, if the infection, if the uh, it is streptococcal, uh, streptococcus pneumonia, which is penicillin susceptible, then we give penis, uh, penicillin or ampicillin as the first drug of choice. 
and if the child is uh, allergic to beta lactam antibiotics then we give uh, cefuroxime cefotaxime ceftriaxone or sometimes clindamycin if we uh, in uh, intermediate and resistant strains then again the we give cefotaxime ceftriaxone linezolid and the most oral uh, the most active oral cephalosporin in vitro against penicillin resistant strains is sevdinil so we can think of sevdinil also in pneumococcal uh, serotype 19a if we are thinking of a pneumococcal serotype 19a then vancomycin linezolid are good choices okay so uh, pneumonia complications of pneumonia what we need to think of are the respiratory complications that are pleural effusion uh, that is empyemas pneumatoceles can develop necrotizing pneumonia can develop and lung abscesses can develop bronchopleural fistula is also uh, something that we need to keep in mind and definitely pneumothorax other complications are like hyponatremia can develop and other uh, this is the respiratory complications the sepsis or systemic complications are inflammatory response syndrome meningitis pericarditis endocarditis osteomyelitis septic arthritis central nervous system abscesses and it can have an atypical uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome so these are the complications that can develop in a child with pneumonia I think we need to uh, restart the PowerPoint. Yeah, I'm very sorry. Is it visible now? Yes, yeah, sir. It's visible now. Sorry, I'm sorry. There was a problem, so the PowerPoint had stopped. Okay, so we were here. This child had come for follow up, and this child had there was a gross uh, real improvement in the X-ray. Okay, so we come to the next child. Uh, Ayush was a 10-month-old male child who presented with cough and cold for one month. One month. There was difficulty in respiration for 10 days. This child was admitted and treated outside with antibiotics and nebulizations. There was persistence of fever, so was referred to our hospital. This child had a history of convulsions, which is unrelated to this episode. Birth history and development history was normal. Immunization history was up to date. And this child had a family history of uh, asthma, but nothing else. On examination, the child had a uh, poor weight. Uh, weight. This, uh, the temperature was high, this, there was tachypnea, respiratory rate was uh, around 50, the saturation was uh, 
the saturation was around 96% in oxygen of 5 liters and this child was well perfused so this child had recessions bilateral diffuse crepitations and bronchi and other systems were grossly normal so this child was reviewed by the pediatric neurologist he said nothing to bother about the convulsion the history of convulsion we continued with the anti epileptics the uh, child had normal counts and a chest x ray was done which was like this so there were diffuse opacities bilaterally that could be seen in this child so uh, gradually the respiratory distress worsened the child increased oxygen need so child was shifted to the intensive care unit and a ct scan was done and again the ct scan re revealed a uh, thick bronchial walls with a suggestive of interstitial pneumonitic patches so now what are we dealing with a prolonged history this child is worsening so this child has got fever this child has got tachypnea so next day the child uh, was less tachypneic but however the problems persisted and oxygen dependent was still uh, the child was still oxygen dependent and this is where we were brought into the picture a bronchoscopy was done and a bronchoscopy revealed thick cheesy material in the bronchus thick and bronchial walls thick cheesy material which was coming out from the uh, bronchi so this was we were thinking of a of a tuberculosis a bronchial viral lavage was sent which came back as nat positive and rifampicin insensitive so this child we had started on anti tubercular drugs and this child was discharged on anti tubercular drugs so here we are thinking of a child a pediatric child with a tuberculosis where we have a persistent fever for more than 2 weeks without a known cause so that is important so we have a persistent fever an unremitting cough and there's a weight loss of 5% or no weight gain for the past 3 months so persistent fever unremitting cough and weight loss if that is there with or without so we don't need a history of contact with tb so even if there is no history of contact with tb the first thing that we need to do now is the chest x ray so there has been certain changes this year which has happened in the management and the diagnosis of tuberculosis so you do an x ray if the chest x ray is normal then either you evaluate what the re for the reason for fever so you think of an extra permeable tuberculosis or you can consider referral to a higher center now supposing if there are non specific shadows so uh, uh, you give an appropriate course of antibiotic if the x rays are highly suggestive of tuberculosis then you either or if the child has already received a course of antibiotic and the shadows are still persistent then you send the expectorated sputum or induced sputum or gastric aspirate or maybe a bronchial viral lavage for a nucleic acid amplification test for mycobacterium now two things can happen one is the nat comes as positive so if the nat comes as positive then we are confirmed that this is a microbiologically confirmed tuberculosis and we need to see whether it is rifampicin resistance or rifampicin sensitive if we have, if it is rifampicin resistance then we go into the drug resistant tuberculosis treatment if the if it is rifampicin sensitive then we start treating with the first line the anti tubercular drugs now if it is nat negative then we look have to look for other significant sites like a significantly enlarged peripheral lymph node which can be aspirated for mycobacterium tuberculosis we may need to repeat the nat and do a more invasive investigation like a lavage and or we may need to seek help from a higher center now by doing these if we again get nat positive then uh, we need to see whether it's rifampicin sensitive or resistance and treat accordingly if it is nat negative then either uh, or we could not repeat the test then and if it is nothing else is probably fitting into the picture then uh, we can treat it as a clinically diagnosed probable tuberculosis case so a clinically diagnosed probable tb after all these turn out to be negative we can think of a clinically uh, diagnosed probable tb this child uh, for completed 7 months of course 9 uh, months of atd no chest symptoms was gaining weight so now uh, this was a diagnosed case of tuberculosis note that the drug dosages have changed so rifampicin is now 10 to 
INH is 7 to uh, 15, pyrazinamide is 30 to 40, ethambutol is 15 to 25, and streptomycin is 15 to 20. So 15, 10, 35, 20, 20 is the drugs that we need to use for uh, treatment. So there has been a slight increase in the uh, dosage that we need to give. And what has also changed this year is the guidelines for treatment of tuberculosis. So the CAT2 regimen has been done away with. So all cases, either it is rifampicin resistance or rifampicin sensitive. So if it is rifampicin sensitive, new, new microbiologi microbiologically confirmed rifampicin sensitive, new clinically diagnosed rifampicin sensitive TB, or if it is a rifampicin sensitive extrapulmonary TB, or newly diagnosed extrapulmonary TB, they all come into the same picture. So this was what was previously CAT1. Now a drug sensitive, if it is drug sensitive, so whether it is recurrence, whether it is treatment after loss to, loss to follow up, or whether it's a treatment failure, if it is still rifampicin sensitive, it is uh, goes under the same treatment. So that is the difference that has happened. So this, what we used to be CAT2 previously has been removed. So it is all uh, same, either it is uh, rifampicin sensitive tuberculosis or rifampicin resistant tuberculosis. Only thing what we need, to, what has also changed, which was also there previously, is the addition of ethambutol, which goes on into the continuation phase. So uh, you give two months of uh, HRZE and four months of HRE as a treatment for rifampicin sensitive pulmonary tuberculosis. However, if you are thinking of a uh, uh, neurotuberculosis, bone, joint, or spinal TB, then this has to be increased to 10 months. And uh, in the disseminated forms, it can be increased up to 7 to 10 months. Okay, now we'll come to another child, 11-month-old infant. This child is having recurrent fever. So 11 months, recurrent fever, moist cough, wheezing since very early age. So this cannot be asthma. If somebody is wheezing from one month of age, this cannot be asthma. Along with that, we have some other uh, red flag signs because recurrent fever, moist cough. A child with asthma will not have moist cough. So the usual thing what we do is nebulization or maybe inhalers to these children. That is not going to help. We need to come to a diagnosis. What is the cause? And look at this, the weight, there's no weight gain at all. 11 months, the child is weighing around 5 kgs, whereas the birth weight was uh, three kgs. And again, this child has got clubbing. So that is another red flag sign that, the, that we've got. There is tachypnea, there is fever, and there is bilateral diffuse crepitations and bronchi in this child. So we are dealing with something different. And if you see, this is one lobe which is affected. This is another uh, uh, infection. There's another infection. So there are multiple infections that are happening in this child. So recurrent pneumonias in different lobes of the lung. That is what is happening in this child. And we've, uh, you can see there is some amount of uh, hyponatremia, hypokalemia, and hypochloremia in this child. A CT scan was done, which revealed the same thing, bilateral diffuse uh, opacities. A bronchoalveolar lavage was done, which revealed thick mucus secretions. So these secretions were very, very thick mucus secretions. Uh, neutrophil count was around 92% and pseudomonas grew in this child. So there's the uh, diagnosis written all over. This child is having cystic fibrosis. Sweat chloride was done, which was 78. So if there are one or more phenotypic features or if there is a history of CF in a sibling or a positive newborn screening test, then that is one. And if there is an increased sweat chloride on two occasions or identification of two CF mutations, or uh, abnormal nasal epithelial ion transport. So these are the criteria for diagnosis of cystic fibrosis in a child. And thus, this brings us to the point of a recurrent pneumonia. So there are two episodes in the same year or three or more episodes over any period of time. So that is when we call it a recurrent pneumonia. And in between the two episodes, there has to be a complete resolution of clinical and radiological findings. So that is where we are thinking of a recurrent pneumonia. So recurrent pneumonia can be clinical or radiological or both. And we need to differentiate between recurrent and persistent. And therefore, we need to find out whether 
in between the two episodes of pneumonia, the child had recovered completely. We need to differentiate whether it is a single lobe or multiple lobes that have been involved. And if it is pulmonary alone or extra pulmonary involvement was there, and we need to look out for the red flag signs as was discussed. So if we have a unilobular recurrent pneumonia, then think of a congenital airway anomaly, a cardiovascular anomaly. Very commonly, we can see a, recur a, a retained foreign body. There can be med mediastinal adenopathy leading to a middle lobe syndrome. A multilobular pneumonia, uh, recurrent pneumonia could be due to recurrent aspirations and gastric, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, immunodeficiency, uh, cystic fibrosis, or a primary ciliary dyskinesia. So uh, abnormal anatomy and abnormal physiology both can lead to uh, 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 recurrent pneumonia. Abnormal anatomy, usually unilobular. Abnormal physiology, physiology usually multilobular. So how do we approach a child with a recurrent pneumonia? So recurrent pneumonia, again, can be multiple lobes or single lobe. If it is single lobe, it could be an intraluminal uh, obstruction. It could be an ex extraluminal obstruction. It could be a structural anomaly. If it is multiple lobes, then think of aspirations, asthma, immunodeficiency, mucociliary dysfunction, structural anomalies, and other interstitial lung diseases. What are the red flag signs that we were discussing previously? We had, again, previously enumerated in our child. So the severe failure to thrive, if there is clubbing or cyanosis, a persisting or prolonged progressive hypoxia, very early, the symptoms start from very early in infancy, moist sound or a cough or a productive cough, which can never be asthma. So think of immunodeficiency, uh, think of immunodeficiencies and uh, some other problems in this child. So these are red flag signs for respiratory uh, complaints and feeding difficulties and choking in these children. A focal oscillatory findings are very important. If these children have chest pain, chest wall abnormalities, hemoptysis, if this child has got an exertional dyspnea, multi-system involvement uh, like uh, lead, uh, as a result of immunodeficiencies, muscular, neuromuscular abnormalities and developmental issues. So these are all red flag signs. Now, uh, invest, uh, real world analysis was done on the antibiotic sensitivity patterns like of azithromycin vis a vis uh, coamoxiclav in the pediatric population. So what was done was these children, uh, uh, antibiotic sensitivity patterns was done in a skin and soft tissue infections. And here you see that uh, in uh, for Staphylococcus aureus, they were more or less comparable. E. coli definitely, uh, coamoxiclav scored better. Uh, MRSA uh, azithromycin was better than coamoxiclav and streptococcus uh, species, again, uh, coamoxiclav was much, much better. So this was uh, in the skin and soft tissue infections, blood infections, both of them showed comparable uh, activity against salmonella. Uh, however, uh, staph showed a much better activity uh, against E. coli and, strep, uh, and staph aureus. So here, the uh, coamoxiclav was much better. But again, Salmonella, both of them were more or less sim uh, similar. In the respiratory tract infections, so here again, uh, if you see uh, more than two years of age, streptococcus uh, showed good, good activity against streptococcus vis a vis uh, azithromycin. Around eight of 10 cases, amoxicillin uh, clavulonic acid showed activity against streptococcus species. So here, if you see, uh, amoxicillin is much, much better, uh, bo uh, both in streptococcus and staphylococcus, and more than five years, again, streptococcus and staphylococcus uh, coamoxiclav is much, much better. So this was the sample distribution that was done in these children. So zero to two years, three to five years, six to eight years, nine to 11 years, and uh, 12 to 18 years. So uh, it was a uniform distribution that was taken. So grossly, coamoxiclav still remains amoxicillin. If it is not available, then coamoxiclav, preferably amoxicillin alone, still remains the drug of choice for uh, the first line of treatment for all these, particularly the respiratory infections. So what are the carry home messages? 
let us identify the normal child, the atopic child, the child children with chronic underlying conditions and immunodeficiencies. Most of the respiratory recurrent respiratory infections are viral infections occurring in quick succession. Many of the so-called recurrent respiratory infections actually represent asthma. So that is why it is so important that you need to diagnose whether these are recurrent respiratory infections and whether they have this, uh, it's persisting for more than 10 days. And if it is persisting for continuously uh, 10 days with thickening of the respiratory secretions. Recurrent bacterial infections are always secondary to underlying structural and functional abnormalities. So we need to find out whether it is a severe persistent uh, infection with unusual organisms and are recurrent in nature, which leads us to the acronym of SPUR. So once we talk of SPUR, it means a severe persistent uh, infection with unusual organisms and recurrent in nature. And this is suggestive of immunodeficiency. So we need to watch out for the red flag signs in tuberculosis where it is more of more of persistent nature than a recurrent uh, uh, symptoms and all unexplained symptoms are not necessarily tuberculosis. So we need to really uh, try to diagnose tuberculosis before we start treating for tuberculosis. So acknowledgements are all majority of my patients from whom I've got these. So they're living pages of my book. And again, I've taken a lot of help from the uh, IAP RTIJ module, the IAP mini respire module, IAP TB module, and I'm indebted to them. Thank you for your patience. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, sir. It was a wonderful session, sir. We have received a few questions, sir. I'll take that. Sir, the first question is that uh, what antibiotics sh should be given in a routine OPD when culture facilities are not available? Yes, so that's what when we are thinking of a respiratory infection. So if we are thinking of a viral infection, we do not give any antibiotics. We have to wait and reassure the parents and ask them to come back if there is any symptom. And particularly if, if it is persisting for more than 10 days. And if it is, we are thinking of a bacterial infection, uh, then the uh, drug of choice, the first line would be uh, amoxicillin. Uh, if it is not available for any reason, then comoxiclav, but then amoxicillin is the drug of choice, usually in respiratory infections. Yes, sir. And next question is usage of anti-MRSA uh, treatment uh, in every patient. Sir, uh, what's your opinion on this? No, 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 not in every patient, only when we discussed about MRSA. So there are specific uh, things when, which we look for when we are thinking of MRSA. For supposing a uh, community acquired MRSA is not common at all. So if the child is a, it's a nosocomial pneumonia, then you think of MRSA. If the child has got a pyoderma, you think of MRSA. If the child is, is a post measles infection, you think of MRSA. So these are instances when you think, start thinking of MRSA and uh, then you give MRSA cover. Otherwise, every child, we do not need to give an MRSA cover. No. Sir, what are the current recommendations for management of uh, pneumonia and what are their limitations? Uh, that's what pneumonia, the management, uh, initial, the current recommendation uh, as far our country goes is uh, diagnose pneumonia based on the respiratory rate. So as the WHO has given the criteria that we discussed, so if you see that there's tachypnea, think of uh, uh, pneumonia and uh, there are no investigations needs to be done. So if you diagnose pneumonia in a child with has got fever and tachypnea, think of pneumonia, start antibiotics. So that is the uh, current uh, treatment initially in the outpatient department. The, the uh, problems with that is not all children with tachypnea are pneumonias. So there can be other find other cases of tachypnea. They're supposing there is a child with asthma, there's a child with bronchiolitis, there's a child with uh, viral V's. So all these can be missed. So we cannot uh, uh, classify them in one umbrella as pneumonia as in all children with tachypnea. And then we, uh, uh, without doing uh, investigations, baseline investigations, chest X-ray, blood investigations, sometimes we can miss a few uh, infections. And nowadays, since these are available and gradually as the days go by, these will become more and more cheaper. The, uh, the biofire investigations where we will know what is the offending organism, then it will be much more easier for us to tackle. So 
a known enemy which will be much better than an unknown uh, enemy so that is why a biofire and all these investigations might need to be done quite early when we are thinking of a child who is not responding as the way a uh, normal viral infection should respond so those are things that we need to keep in mind sir the another question is what condition should be include in the differentiation diagnosis of bronchial uh, bronchiolitis uh other things are like you know the uh, if the child has got an acute onset of wheeze then uh, it depends on what age is the child uh, there and what are the predisposing conditions so if this is the first episode of wheeze in a young child with a predisposing uh, episode of a uh, nasal discharge and cold and there is some history of uh, cold and coryza in the family Uh, then there is uh, very few diagnosis uh, dds are there so it will be the bronchiolitis now if supposing this child is having recurrent episodes then we will not call it bronchiolitis anymore then we will either call it a viral induced wheeze now if this is persisting for a long time then probably it uh, this is uh, this child is probably going to develop asthma so that is these are things that we need to keep in mind the other thing that we need to keep in mind is whether this uh, child with a uh, aspirated foreign body so it depends again on the age of the child or if there is even if a smaller child if there is a elder sibling in the family who could have put something in the mouth of this child so that we need to uh, be careful and but here again it will be very acute onset and um, uh, uh, you might or might not have a history of insertion of foreign body and there will be no uh, predisposing uh, uh, period of coryza cold fever cough that will not be there so it will be sudden onset of respiratory distress that's all sir another interesting question is that uh, how many days after the onset of upper respiratory tract symptoms can it take for the rsv infection uh, spread to the lower respiratory tract rsv usually the incubation period is around 2 to 2 uh, to 4 days so usually after the after around 2 to 4 days this uh, thing starts in the lower respiratory infection the, the lower respiratory infection starts but uh, it's very difficult to actually uh, you know classify that today the uh, infection in the nose happened and uh, how many days it took for the respiratory distress to start but usually the bronchiolitis for bronchiolitis the incubation period is around 2 to 4 days so uh, that is what it usually takes for the uh bronchiolitis to set in and sir for this uh, what preventive steps uh, we should take to avoid uh, this further uh, infection spread uh that is very important and uh, nowadays uh, in the present uh, situation of covid 19 uh, whatever preventive steps are being mentioned are the ones that were mentioned lifelong for bronchiolitis prevention and all that you know so frequent hand washing use of a uh, uh, hand sterilizer which should contain more than at least 70% ethanol and uh, anybody having cold and cough in the family should wear a face mask so all these things are the preventive measures uh, that should be used in a child with uh, uh, to prevent bronchiolitis and uh, then again we uh, f- only for specific for rsv we have a monoclonal antibody in the name of palibizumab but then that is not commonly used for various reasons that it is one it is very costly and then it has to be given monthly for 5 months so it is usually used in very premature babies uh, or in babies who have got history of say chronic respiratory infections who have uh, got a history of a uh, 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 bronchopulmonary dysplasia or immunosuppression or something like that so these are the neonates where we can give uh, palibizumab but then it is extremely costly so it is uh, not very commonly used even in the west sir uh, since uh, last one hour we are discussing on antibiotics means management of upper respiratory lower respiratory and there is a, a usage of uh, uh, very common antibiotics sir sir do you think that means uh, it affects lung microbiota if you give a lo- for long time uh, uh yes definitely see what happens is 
uh, you have to categorize uh, the and you have to be choosing your antibiotic very carefully so for example if you have a bacterial infection in the lungs then definitely you need to give antibiotics there is no question about that but there is no need to give an unnecessary antibiotic in a child who is probably having a viral infection so unnecessarily exposing these children to uh, antibiotics uh, when you don't need them definitely will cause uh, problems in the lung microbiota, uh, microbiota. so that uh, we need to be very careful about and uh, long term antibiotics uh, are uh, usually not given in respiratory infections but yes they can be uh, uh, yes uh, like supposing if this child has got a Mm, uh, uh, commonest antibiotic that is used is uh, azithromycin and that is not used as an antibiotic it is used as an immunomodulator so in children with a chronic lung disease the only antibiotic that is long term used is azithromycin okay sir another question is how to choose a antibiotic and its duration in straightforward and complicated pneumonia yeah that's what we discussed so supposing if uh, the first uh, if you have a straightforward pneumonia the first drug for me will be amoxicillin or maybe comoxiclav depending on the availability and all that and uh, the duration will be 7 days if it's an upper respiratory infection then again the same drug amoxicillin given for 10 days and uh, if it's a complicated pneumonia then it depends on what we are dealing with so if this child we started on the antibiotic we reviewed this child after 48 to 72 hours the child did not improve of the or the child worsened and then we think of uh, the uh, the offending organism so we start thinking whether there is a, 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 a necrotizing pneumonia then we start thinking of an mrsa then we step it up to vancomycin or maybe uh, we add clindamycin or linezolid or something like that so that is how the or this child develops a pleural effusion then we need we need to drain the pleural effusion and we may need to uh, step up the antibiotics accordingly so that is how the treatment will change uh, but uh, up front yes the uh, the drug of choice will be amoxicillin okay, sir. sir one last question is means what factor influences decision on antibiotic duration in lrti yes again the uh, the response of the child so if the child is otherwise uh, fine healthy the child does not have an immunocompromise uh, then we start off with uh, usually comoxiclav or amoxicillin and give it for a duration of 7 days if there are other features the red flag signs are there like the child has got a poor failure to thrive this child has got a, 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 a say a cystic fibrosis immunosuppressed or uh, immunocompromised so any other feature is there then we start thinking of other things like supposing if it's a child with cystic fibrosis then we will think of either a staph or a pseudomonas so uh, so like that if, if this child has got an hiv then we will think of pneumocystis so that's how we we'll decide on the antibiotics uh, choice of antibiotics in any child okay sir thank you sir we have taken all the questions sir Uh, thanks for your uh, wonderful and very informative session sir i hope this will help to the pediatrician in their routine life and the most important part is that sir uh, uh, this presentation was fully practical rather than any theoretical one so that is the best part sir thanks a lot sir thank you thank you thank you very much thank you Zulfai, now you can end the webinar. Okay.